Hello, I'm Niall Brown, and welcome to this episode of the Movies in Focus podcast. Making its premiere at the Venice Film Festival in 2014, She's Funny That Way was the final narrative feature from the late Peter Bogdanovich, starring Owen Wilson, Imogen Poots, Catherine Hahn, Will Fort, Rhys Evans and Jennifer Aniston. The film was a screwball comedy which, while enjoyable, never truly felt like a cohesive vision from the master writer-director. And that's because it wasn't. Originally filmed as Squirrels to the Nuts, Bogdanovich's vision for the film was compromised during post-production, and after he finished his edit, he conducted reshoots and removed a lot of the film's multi-strand plot. It was believed that this director's cut was lost altogether, and that's where James Kenney comes in. A lifelong fan of Peter Bogdanovich, Kenney is a teacher and a film writer at Trembleside Wonder, with an eye for collecting scripts and other film materials. One evening, he was trawling through eBay when he noticed a HD tape for sale titled Squirrels to the Nuts. The label on the tape stated a running time much longer than that of the final film, and it transpired that Kenny had discovered what is likely the only remaining copy of Bogdanovich's true vision. Ultimately, Kenny ended up connecting with Bogdanovich, who began working to get his version of Squirrels to the Nuts released. Sadly, Bogdanovich died in January 2022, before he could achieve this. But now Squirrels to the Nuts is getting a limited run at New York's MoMA, and it looks like the film will also get a full release at a later date. Fascinated by the story, I reached out to James Kenny over Twitter and invited him onto the Movies in Focus podcast to talk about what unfolded. In this episode, we discuss how James discovered the director's cut of Squirrels to the Nuts, and how he worked with Bogdanovich to help get the film released. We also discuss the writer-director's career and a host of other topics. As always, I hope you like what we had to talk about. Hello, James. Thank you for joining the Movies in Focus podcast. Good morning. So glad to be here. Hi. And we're here to talk about, I mean, I don't know how to describe it. Is it Peter Bogdanovich's lost final film or his final film? What would you call it? Uh, I mean, I would guess I would call it his lost and found <laughs> final <laughs> film in the, in, in the sense that, um, as people know, uh, Peter passed away in January of this year. Uh, and his last fictional film, last theatrical um, directed film, was was released in around 2015 and was called She's Funny That Way. Um, and the funny thing about it was it came out and it got middling to poor reviews. You know, some people, you know, it was like, you know, they were fairly, you know, um, kind to it, I guess I should say. <laughs> like it wasn't... Um, uh, but it came and went without a fuss. And in fact, one of the interesting things that I've discussed in, in, my, in my dealings with this film is that he never told anybody officially, you know, the film had been taken out of his hands and and he was forced to do uh, changes he didn't want to do. Um, when the film came out, you know, he did press for it. Uh, he did a DVD commentary with Louis Stratton, his ex-wife and co-writer of the film. And, and so people kind of just accepted it um and i think kind of sadly that oh yeah i guess peter really is a 20th century director you know he made this film it didn't really come together and he never made another theatrical film but as it turns out um me being the only true peter Bogdanovich fan on earth no <laughs> i'm kidding but i but i i i sense something was wildly wrong with it and what i mean by that is uh you know Peter had a film in the 1980s called Illegally Yours with Rob Lowe that was a bit of a misfire. It wasn't a success. Um, he had taken a film with no real script and just kind of faked his way through it for two hours. You know, for, um, but, and you see it, and I feel it has a certain charm because you still recognize Peter Bogdanovich in the film, his style of filmmaking, his choices. You know, She's Funny This Way has all this voiceover narration and this, you know, this endless um, uh, character blathering on telling us you know, um, what's going on as opposed to showing us. And and it was cut very choppily. And there's a musical score. And none of this is what Peter Bogdanovich would generally use, you know, whether it's the last picture show or What's Up Doc or They All Laughed or Mask um, or Cat's Meow, his last theatrical film before it. Uh, there's no score. You know, he doesn't he doesn't use a score. He uses soundtrack songs and, and the noises. And so I just I just said some, something went wrong here. I was ready to believe Peter screwed up, you know, that maybe somehow the movie sure. was a mess. Um, because he hadn't said anything, but uh, have you seen um, She's Funny That Way, the, the recut version? Um, I saw, yeah, I mean, I reviewed it when it came out sort of okay, yeah, six years ago, ago, and I sort of dipped in a couple of times. I didn't get to sort of give it a full rewatch, but I mean, oh, fair enough. Yeah. from the very first moment on screen, it's a different film, you know, <laughs> it's an utterly different very different film. film. I mean, the characters have different fates. Uh, 
Um, and, and if and, you know, so if you saw it, among other things, like towards the end, you know, while while Imogen Poots is blathering on and on in her interview, she would talk over, and they would show clips of, like, for example, the party sequence, which is the big climax of Squirrels to the Nuts, with all the characters in it, you know, and extras and and everything. And you saw a couple brief glimpses of it, and you know, knowing anything about filmmaking, I'm like, they didn't bring in the entire cast and extras just for a couple seconds of footage, you know, like there, yeah. there was something that seemed very wrong about it. Um, uh, also, for the, 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 I mean, again, especially Europe, Europe knows her better than America. The fact that Joanna Lumley only shows up in the ending credits of She's Funny That Way, <laughs> you know, like yes. you're doing the credit roll, and and she shows up, and they have to actually explain. There's a title, you know, I forgot Jennifer Aniston's character's name for the moment, but you know, uh, the mother of Jennifer Aniston. It actually says on the screen as she as she has one shot, and so I just assume the film was a mess and I you know sadly whatever word you want to use oh Peter kind of blew it you know something went wrong um and then I don't know you know do you want me to explain a little about keep going about how squirrels <laughs> yeah you know definitely I mean because I I, I think the whole thing's fat I mean so any yeah. when you find these different versions of movies and you realize that they've been totally re recut and rehandled yes. it's so fascinating to find out so coming from you hit me with it yeah. all yeah yeah no I mean I think um so, so Peter delivered the film, and I guess the argument would be, you know, what the, the comment that stuck with me was it was lawyer's advice why he didn't talk at the time. And I think the idea being he was in his mid-70s, he hadn't had a theatrical film in 12 or 13 years since Cat's Meow, um, that being known as kind of a difficult auteurist in a sense, you know, one of those 1970s directors who thinks they, they have the right, you know, to, to, to do whatever they want. Sure. And, you know, he, and he had sued Universal when they took the Bruce Springsteen songs out of mask behind his back, you know, so I think he was afraid he was going to be looking unemployable if he showed up again and then was difficult and going to the press like he had done in the past sometimes. Um, but I think, I mean, he agrees. I think he miscalculated because when people saw She's Funny That Way, well, I don't want to say miscalculated, but when people saw She's Funny That Way, it kind of looked like a director who maybe his time had passed, you know, very a great director who got some good actors to show up and there's some good moments in it. But um, whereas Squirrels to the Nuts, if people see that, they would have realized, you know, you know, I think I said this to a friend the other day that um, even if you don't like Squirrels to the Nuts, it's, it's, it's unmistakably a Peter Bogdanovich film at full throttle. You know, it, it's it could have come out in 1976. You know, it, there's not there's nothing he wasn't uh, capable of that he wasn't still capable of in the 21st century. Apparently, you know that that he um, and so so the film died and nobody cared in a sense. You know, and and he went on. He made a documentary about Buster Keaton and and did some more writing. Um, but obviously, I would you know what he wants to do is direct. He's a director. You know, yeah. one of the best ever. So so I um. It's not as romantic as me just looking for Squirrels to the Nuts. I'm a Peter Bogdanovich fan, so I'd go on eBay sometimes and just look up his name. And, you know, I've, I've gotten some scripts of his of unproduced films and things like that. But I was always looking for Squirrels for the Nuts because I thought, well, th there might, maybe I'll find a screenplay or something. You know, something that would let me know what his original intention was because, yeah. you know, I'm fascinated. I'm, I'm a huge fan. But, I mean, I guess I was looking since... Um, you know, 2015, <laughs> like five years. It's a long time, yeah. Of, no, of nothing coming up. Um, now, I kind of feel I was fated to find this because in the in my article on my on my website, if I may mention my website. The, you Tremble, can indeed, yes. Yeah, tremblesiwonder.com. I wrote about this whole experience. Um, a, I br a brilliant my, article, I have to say. It's fantastic. I've read it twice. Oh, thank you. So, yeah, yeah, no, and, and I, so a year before it ever showed up in the States or even in Europe, I think, I got my hands on a bootleg copy from the nice Chinese lady who sells bootleg DVDs, at, you know, in my neighborhood. Um, it had Arabic subtitles on it, you know. So I, I was very excited because I guess one thing I should double back and say was, she, uh, she's funny that way, or squirrels to the nuts, or whatever you want to call it. It was his first self-generated project since they all laughed in 1981. I mean, right. everything since then had been a work for hire. You know, Mask was for Universal. Um, noises off was Frank Marshall got him a gig. You know, he, he hadn't been able to create a project like he had done in the 70s up to they all laughed. Even the Cat's until, Meow 20 years ago, that was... Yeah, well, that wasn't a screenplay. That was a play that, you know, some I, I believe because of his reputation of knowing classic Hollywood, they came to him smartly. Right. You know, good, a good idea. But, um, you know, Squirrels to the Nuts was the first film like they all after St. Jack or, you know, where it's really, you know, the auteurist has an idea and wants to execute it, not somebody comes to him and just says, here's a gig, you know? Yep. So I was very excited. And when I watched that tape, I mean, I, I took it personally because I'm like this. Wow. <laughs> that, that's why I was kind of nervous after all this time. Um, but I did believe maybe he was too ambitious. Maybe he, he was getting older. He couldn't quite pull it together. 
And then, um, and, and, and he had never mentioned any problems. Although when you look back, he did, you know, as I mentioned, I quoted in my uh, article, when he was doing press for the film, he would quote lines that were cut out of the movie. <laughs> he, he, he would say, oh, Owen Wilson said this in another version. And I, you felt kind of a passive cry for help a little bit, you know, like- Let, let, us, see, let us see that, yeah. Um, so, so come, I guess, October, November, October, 2020, I guess it's a Sunday night. I'm looking on eBay and I see squirrels to the nuts slash she's funny that way, HD cam videotape. Um, but there was no indication there was anything special about it other than it was a production tape. It was definitely like something not for the general market. Um, the, the seller certainly didn't seem to know. And the seller was offering it for $150. Okay. Cause it's a production tape, I guess. Um, and I was suspicious, you know, meaning, well, A, this could be, first of all, I can't play this thing. You know, it comes on a tape that you need to get some $10,000, uh, you know, professional machine to play it on. Um, and also, you know, the person wasn't indicating anything special about it. You know, you know, if you, if you knew you had a unique cut, you'd probably try to charge a little more, you know, the one and only cut of, um, so I, uh, but I did look at the, the photo and it said 113 minute running time. And, and she's funny that way is 89 minutes or something like that. And so then became the next issue. Well, it could be a misprint. It could be a tape with no sound. You know, it could be a lot of things. If I'm going to buy this thing and convert it, which would cost me another hundred something dollars. Um, on the other hand, I was utterly fascinated. You know, it's kind of, I mean, I'm sure you've been there as a collector. I knew I was going to get it, but I, I yes, like, oh, yeah, <laughs> you, you delay it until the play. last minute. Yeah, <laughs> it's like this. Is, well, it's not even that. I wouldn't say that because once I saw it, of course, I start panicking. Somebody else is going to buy this in the next three minutes, even though it had been sitting there online for several months, apparently. <laughs> so, <laughs> so everybody had their chance, suckers. You know, <laughs> so, so, so the idea was, um, but I texted Bill Tech, who uh, made the documentary about um, Bogdanovich called One Day Since Yesterday in around 2015. <laughs> Um, or, or DM'd him on Twitter. We were social media friends. Um, and I said, do you know anything about, you know, I knew Squirrels to the Nuts was the original title because the film, I don't know if you know these things, but it was originally announced and it had a lot of different actors. Yes. Um, Brie, yeah. Brie Larson was originally in the Imogen Poots part. Uh, Jason Schwartzman was in the Will Forte part. Um, Olivia Wilde was in the Jennifer Aniston part. Um, I think Owen Wilson was there most of the time, but it, it, it struck, it was a project that, you know, people were aware of for a long time. And you know, I live in New York City and there would be on, in the New York Post photos of, you know, Owen Wilson drinking water near Central Park while they were shooting, you know, so it was a film that had been out there. So I knew it was called Squirrels to Nuts originally, but the running time was really throwing me. So I, I asked um, Bill Tech and he wrote back, you know, I'm paraphrasing a little bit like, like oh my God, I think that might be the Lubitsch cut. <laughs> and so I'm like, Lubitsch cut, what are you talking about? I mean, you know, because I was, I was assuming, which seems a reasonable enough assumption, and I was very happy, oh, maybe this is a work print. You know, it was unfinished, it didn't have all the sound, um, there might be scenes missing, but I would get a better sense of what he was originally going for, which was thrilling enough anyway. But then, the, but then Bill um, relayed to me that when he was working on the documentary, you know, there, there were rumblings, you know, that he would be talking to Peter and, and, and Louise would be on the phone in the background, perhaps arguing a bit with one of the producers, <laughs> like the thing that things weren't really going well. Um, and so I guess it was the world's best kept secret. Yeah, that's that's she's funny that way was a compromised film. That's when I started really getting official confirmation of that. So I went, I bought, well, I lowballed the guy because I'm a working man. <laughs> I offered him $100 as opposed to 150 and he took it. Uh, and an interesting fact, I'll, I'll jump ahead because I didn't find this out until later. The guy who was selling it, um, he specializes, I don't know if over there it's, you have a similar situation. You know, people can rent storage lockers when they don't have enough space yep. at home. He's one of those guys who basically just bids on storage lockers that, are, that went unpaid. You know, basically the storage companies say, hey, come on and bid on this. Nobody paid their bill. Um, right. And so it wasn't like he knew anything about it. He just bid on, you know, on, on various storage lockers. And he's, he's found interesting things, of course. It's New York City. Um, one storage locker had a Chuck Close painting that he ended up selling for $15,000 or something like that. And another storage locker had ecstasy pills in it. Right. Know, <laughs> kind of stuff. Um, but, but, but so he got this tape and he just put it up. So he doesn't know, you know, he couldn't tell me exactly which storage locker it came from. Yeah. Because of course, a great question is, who kept this tape, which turned out to be the only existing copy of Peter Bogdanovich's cut. As of today, they never found another one, apparently. Well, and, um, it's, and it's pristine. I mean, because much like you, when I sat down to watch it, I thought there's going to be a few sort of missing bits and pieces. It's a full film sort of finished, essentially. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's his final cut. It's, um, uh, but it was, it was the cut, I guess, the director's cut. He was uh, 
he had contractual right to to um submit you know i mean in other words i think he was like this is good to go and then uh i'll get i'll get to that stuff in a second but basically so so the guy um whoever stole the tape or took it from the production company you know you wonder did he know you know wow they're messing with this film i'm going to take this copy while i can or was it just some guy working on the film who took his work home one day you know, and, and didn't yeah. think much about it? Um, because you would think if he was really aware of what was going on, he would have tried to contact or she would have tried to contact Peter Bogdanovich. You know, I have your film, but nobody ever spoke to him about it. So so I bought this tape uh, for a hundred bucks. You know, I'll, I'll just go, you know, 33% uh, off, right? <laughs> Not bad or whatever. <laughs> and um, uh, so there was a place in Brooklyn that could convert it. Um, and then the funny thing is when they first brought me uh, it back, converted, I put it on and there was no sound. And I'm like, oh my gosh, there's no sound. I did instantly see that the credit sequence was different. As you see instantly, yeah. it's a wildly different film in tenor and tone. I also saw the running time was 88 minutes. And I'm like, oh my gosh, is this basically the same film with just a different credit sequence with no sound? And kind of, you know, still interesting, but rather disappointing when I was hoping to find something more. But then I got lucky. It turns out they had just screwed up the transfer and it was running 25% too fast. <laughs> and that's why there was no sound. So yeah, they fixed it. And then I got my 113 minute version. Um, and as you've, see, as, as you've seen Squirrels to the Nuts, it, it really feels like wh whoever made She's Funny that way. For those of you who've seen She's Funny that way, you haven't seen Squirrels to the Nuts because it felt like whoever edited it like doesn't like Peter Bogdanovich movies. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> They were taking all the long tapes and, and chopping them up. And, and you know, I would say Bogdanovich has an interesting, you know, morality where I think he often feels if people mean well, you can excuse and forgive a lot of things, you know, in a sense. Yes. You know? um, in St. Jack, one of his classic films about the pimp in Singapore, um, he says, you know, somebody complains, well, I don't pay for sex. And he, and, and he says, you know, people, people make love for so many ridiculous reasons. Why shouldn't money be one of them? Um, and, you know, in other words, like, so he's not condemning the pimp in that, you know, and, and, and it's, a, you know, again, it's a good hearted pimp. And again, he's a good hearted pimp who treats people well and everything. But back to Squirrels to the Nuts, in, in the She's Funny That Way version, you know, Imogen Poots keeps sort of like moralizing, like, oh, I know what he did was wrong, but, you know, he, you know, and, and they actually changed the fates of the characters, right? I, I don't want to give too much away because people are going to be able to see these things, but you know, characters are punished in She's Funny That Way who aren't punished in Squirrels, you know, to the yes. nuts in a sense. Um, and in Squirrels to the Nuts, in the more developed version, the movie really makes clear um, he's a screw-up. Owen Wilson's playing a screw-up. I guess for people who don't know, it's a film about a, a, a theater director who has a tendency to go to, um, who's, who's happily married to Catherine Hahn, but he does go to call girls and escorts, and then he basically kind of falls a little in love with them and always gives them money to leave the trade. <laughs> like he gives them thirty thousand dollars each to leave the trade, <laughs> and then through typical comic uh, happenstance, um, the best actress um, auditioning for his new play is the last call girl he gave thirty thousand dollars to. Um, but you see in that version, you know, the multiple girls that you know he really is doing a good thing. They've all there. You know, these are good people. And he they've all, they've all lived good lives. Yeah. Yeah, and um, and comically, even one of them is now running her own escort service. I mean, that, that's the, that's the, the joke in a sense. But uh, but throughout the, but it's just that she's funny that way. You felt like somebody who just didn't get Bidanovich is like, okay, we're going to add a score because that's what people should do, and we're going to cut this more like a TV movie because that's what people should do. And um, but to me, it's baffling, especially since they were just going to dump it anyway. It was basically a straight to video, video yeah. on demand release. Um. But if it, like we'll talk about the opening credits, you know, the movie begins with these gorgeous shots of New York City with the sun coming up and Frank Sinatra's New York, New York is blasting over it. Squirrels to the Nuts is a New York movie. She's Funny yeah. That Way isn't a New York movie. It's it's like, you know, this this interview footage they added all takes place in Los Angeles. You know, it's like Bogdanovich is saying, I'm back, baby, you know, with his opening credits yes. of, of Squirrels to the Nuts. Um, so somebody's like, let's not make it a New York film. Let's remove all the expensive songs. Let's, let's... Uh, turn it from an ensemble piece into a kind of a Cinderella story where it's mostly focused on, you know, Owen Wilson's no longer the protagonist. I think really she's the, Izzy's the protagonist yes. in the recut version. Um, and, and baffling things like the final 10 minutes being nothing but her talking about what happens to characters. And then Quentin Tar Tarantino shows up all sweaty yeah. <laughs> and nervous looking and talks about dragging her off to a sunny Chiba film festival and that even seems unkind because she was dating the, the you know will forte in the original version who was a good guy so why did she have to dump him too? <laughs> you know? but 
but they, I mean, Bogdanovich was forced to shoot this footage and he, you know, he told me, well, we needed an ending. We needed something to happen. So Tarantino showing up, you know, kind of gave him some sort of event in the last 10 minutes. A but big ending, happened. yeah. But that's, I, mean, you, yeah. Please, yeah. I mean, when you, when you, I mean, I remember watching the, the original and I mean, I was one of those people that was kind to it because of who yeah, it was. Yeah. And watching it, you kind of felt that everyone in it just had time in their schedule to make a film with Peter Bogdanovich. And the new version or the original version, depending on how you want to look at it, <laughs> feels like they went, I want to make this film. Yeah, is- no, you could see, oh, this is what they were trying to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and well, I mean, just, just uh, Owen Wilson's character is completely decimated. He kind of disappears in the last 10 minutes of She's Funny that way because they cut out all the final scenes. Um, but even Jennifer Aniston, as I said, they, they removed the scene with Joanna Lumley, who plays her mother. You know, it's yeah. like they, they, they remove her entire part. Stephen Dorff, uh, you know, is, is, is in She's uh, Squirrels to the Nuts. Uh, it's a cameo, but it's a good cameo. Stephen yeah. Dorff fans would want to see it, you know. Um, what I think happened, and this is one sort of touches upon what you were just saying, is like any film with a budget, um, I, I feel like, you know, they were very smart. Like Owen Wilson and Jennifer Aniston had a, a few moments, but they didn't have too many exterior scenes. You know, Austin Pendleton and Will Forte and George Morfolk and, and Imogen Poots had a lot of stuff in the exteriors. Yeah. And when they recut it, I felt like they were recutting in the typical producer sense. We want more Aniston. We want more Wilson. We don't care about Austin Pendleton. We don't care yeah. about George Morfolk. And, and so it made the film seem cheaper and smaller than it is. When you're watching Squirrels to the Nuts, they're running around the cloisters. There's a whole sequence in, in, the, in the village with the bagpiper and the dog and Austin Pendleton and Will Forte. And they're on the phone together. And it's hilarious scene and i'm not quite sure who saw that and said this has got to go you know? that's it yeah because um, it made the film seem bigger i mean it, it's just it, it gives the film scope you know exteriors with real cars driving behind and and they cut a lot of that stuff out because and i think it was in some bizarre way i mean people have mentioned this. i wonder what you think about this they, they felt the producers maybe wanted to make it more they didn't really get peter bogdanovich and they wanted to turn it sort of into a woody allen film <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I think you're, you're right, um, because, I mean, I think when you always look at a film from a, a big filmmaker, and I always think if it's 90 minutes or under, there's been a lot of editing, yes, you know, so behind the scenes. And like you said, with She's Funny That Way, it's a very short film. And yeah, I, I think, it, I look at it and I think, what were these producers thinking? What did they think they were going to make when they right. made these changes? And I think you're right. It, it was a Woody Allen kind of mighty Aphrodite type film. Yes, I think they were hoping to get. Analogy. I mean, it, 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 I, Imogene Poots, I find very endearing in the film, but um, in the ensemble, it makes more sense because if I may be so bold, her Brooklyn accent is pretty broad and ridiculous. Yeah. I think partially by design. I mean, I think Peter Bernard's like, no, let's go with it. You know, she's kind of this funny yeah. exaggeration. Um, but deciding to make her the narrator of the film, so she keeps warbling on <laughs> with this questionable accent. Yes, um, and, a little goes a long way, you know. <laughs> yeah, and 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 you see in Squirrels to the Nuts when when you just have more of the overall picture, and you know it, it's sort of an exaggerated reality. Sybil Shepherd and Richard Lewis are her parents who can't just scream and hit each other through the entire yeah. film. So it's like she's coming from this loud, you know, uh, uh, outer borough family. That's the gag. Um, but everything in its place. I mean, it's just, there's so much more with, with other characters that, um, and that's what I mean about Bogdanovich. It's, 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 it's beautiful in a sense, because of course, one part of the story that people don't know or is, so I found this tape, I guess I, I'll, I'll talk a little to this now that, um, and luckily I didn't quite know when, but Bill Tech obviously told Big Peter, he's like, hey, Peter, <laughs> you know, this friend of mine in New York, uh, he's a good guy, you can trust him. And by the way, he has squirrels to the nuts. And Peter Bogdanovich wrote me two days later, or three days later, and you know, it's like, oh my gosh, and you, uh, some of that's in the article, but he's, it's like, he was concerned, he, he wasn't concerned, he just said he wasn't sure which cut it was, because as I found out later, there were incremental steps. Um, uh, who told, I guess, uh, Peter Tonget, who wrote the biography, uh, an interview book with Bogdanovich last year, and he's, he's, he's sort of the official expert of, of academia about Bogdanovich, that um, when he was working with Peter on the book, after Peter delivered his cut and people weren't happy for whatever reasons, he saw a version that began with the Jennifer Aniston, Will Forte scene where she, where she gets the phone call, her first scene in the movie, right. which doesn't show up until about 25 or 30 minutes into the movie now. And you get the sense the producers are like, we want Aniston you know, up front because she's the yep. big name. 
Um, so I don't even know how that would have worked, but so it did, does indicate, or it's, it's, it's a fact, there were sort of multiple cuts where he was trying to sort of- Please you know, people. Work with him and, um, and, and, but then he got back to me. He's like, this is it, this, this is my cut. Um, and, and so he was gloriously happy. And then, and then this is where it's like, if I told you the story, you wouldn't believe it except for it's true you know a lifelong fan of you know his favorite director right you know somehow his last movie what turns out sadly to be his last movie um i get my hands on it and i'm able to give it to him directly and, and one night i get a phone call you know hello james this is peter mcdonovich I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like well hi and he goes you know how the fuck did you get my picture <laughs> like you know and again and i, I you know P peter um you know, P Peter is a guy who, who even his personal films, they're often PG rated films, not all of them. So I was even a little taken aback, like Scorsese, I could, I could see him cursing. Peter, yeah. I was kind of thrown <laughs> by, by it. But, um, and so, yes, it, he, he was eternally grateful. I mean, and, and it was a real uh, friendship. I mean, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but what I mean is like, he was very grateful for the film and he sent me some of his unproduced scripts to read. Um, and alas, he was, you know, he was talking about, we would do interviews for a, a series of articles on his television movies, you know, on various things which didn't all come to pass, but I have to think it's still beautiful in a sense that the last 15 months of his life, he knew his film, you know, he was getting ready to release it yes. as opposed to just sitting there thinking, man, they fucked up my film, you know, cause um, he had it, you know, he yeah. said he had it back. And and, uh, and how does it all work with copyright issues? And uh, talk me through that. Cause you find it on video. I'm no expert. Remember, I'm, I'm just a film enthusiast and writer and a teacher. I, I mean, again, uh, possession is nine tenths of the law. I got that tape, baby. It's mine. You know? but, uh, in, in America, anyway. <laughs> but uh, but no, I mean, what? So it wasn't. Um, it, it. I guess it's not my film. But on the other hand, they had no film without my copy. Now, now, in a sense, I'm not. I'm not acting like because I assumed. Don't get me wrong. I always assumed I, I was going to give it back to Peter anyway. I mean, without focusing on the grim stuff. You know, Peter did have some financial problems. He had declared bankruptcy after buying back. They all laughed and trying to yeah. distribute it himself. And so it wasn't like, aha, here I got some, you know, I was happy. Here's your tape. Here's your movie. You know, we, we, we're friends. And he appreciated that. Um, I, I guess it's the idea being that he had said he wanted to try to recut it because obviously at some level, he knew what he had made once upon a time. And he said he was actually going to go to some people and try to get them to give him some money to recut it from scratch. Um, but he admits, you know, that would have been, you know, first of all, they all would have said, yeah, yeah, Peter, sure, because they didn't know how good his original version was. Yeah. Um, and B, it's just trying to, you know, so just getting it handed to him was an incredible thing, because then he was able to show some distributors, here's the movie, we just got to, you know, pay for the music rights and things and, and fix the ending credits and things like that. Um, but, the, but the issue being so that I... I I, it's like, you know, the producers still own the film, I guess, whoever made the film sure. owns the film, but I imagined two things. One, um, as it turns out, I don't know all the details on this, but, you know, not everybody was hostile towards the film. There may have been a producer who was hostile, but in other words, as far as I know, nobody had a problem with reissuing it. I, I have to assume, as producers understand, we're not making any more money off of She's Funny That Way. We might make some money off of Squirrels. To the right, so, yes. So, so they're not going to really hold a grudge, per se, I, you know. Um, uh, so, but the issue, of course, was music rights, which we always yes. hear about everywhere. That that in Peter's version, there's no score, but he does have Tom Petty songs throughout it in the background often, but over which, the ending credits, which won't come cheap, I would imagine. Yeah. Well, well, and, and and New York, New York. Now, the classic stories. I mean, Peter, Peter is a guy. You know, you hear stories about Hollywood, and I, I assume he might have done everything everybody else did in Hollywood, but he really is one of us. He's, you know, he's a movie lover who went out there yeah. to make great movies. He wasn't going out there just, I want to party and be powerful, like, like I imagine, you know, somebody like Don Simpson or Jerry Bruckheimer or somebody might be, you know, it's like, um, and he was always very genuine with me. Uh, so he made friends. In other words, Sinatra, if you don't know, when he made They All Laughed, uh, there was four songs in it, including New York, New York. There were new songs at the time. And Peter couldn't afford it. So Frank Sinatra did that Sinatra thing. He called up somebody and called Peter back and said, $5,000. Can you afford $5,000 for the four songs? <laughs> Which again, <laughs> even in 1980 was probably $250,000 to $300,000 yeah. short of what he would have had to pay. And so Sinatra gave him the songs. And then Tom Petty, the famous story about Tom Petty is when, when Bogdanovich got a phone call to make the Petty documentary. He made a documentary about Tom Petty a few years ago. A brilliant documentary as well. Yeah, yeah, that, that he um, he said yes, and then he hung up the phone and said, "Who's Tom Petty?" <laughs> like it, it wasn't his scene. You know, he's a yeah. Gershwin guy. He's a he's a Cole Porter guy. But it worked out, and they became fast friends. Um, 
to, just to, to show uh, even his last television film, which was called Hustle. And it was the story of Pete Rose, an American baseball player who was a gambler. And it's a very low budget film. It doesn't really work. You know, it, it was kind of like he, that was, I think, one of those financial, I need to take a gig. Uh, but it opens with Bruce Springsteen's Glory Days. And, you know, which would be far above the station of this low budget. Yeah. You know, but I think Springsteen's like, oh, Peter, I'll give it to you for, you know, for yep. cheap. So the problem, though, is with Squirrels is Frank Sinatra has passed away. And, and Nancy and uh, the other sister's name, they're, they're both 78 or 85 or something like that. I really think at this point, the lawyers are, you know, the estate is in yeah. charge. So, so there, there was a problem. This, this is what Peter had been telling me during the year. He's like, oh, no, no, it'll work out. It'll work out. He didn't seem particularly stressed. But he also admitted we're in a music rights kind of hell or whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's not entirely my story to tell because I, I, I'm not on that end. I mean, that was all Peter. And then I guess Louis Stratton and maybe his daughters have sort of finished up the work. Um, but my understanding is, yeah, no, Tom Petty's widow was was absolutely basically signed off on the songs, you know, for the for the Petty songs. And somehow they reached some sort of agreement for the Sinatra, I, I presume. So I, I don't know the details, but that is why. Um, I got the film to him at the end of uh, 2020 and he was just like, we got to get this out there. You know, he, he was you know, excited because I think he realized people can see this and they're going to employ me again. You know, like I, I'll, I'll get, uh, um, but it took apparently o over a year or about a year to get the music rights sewn up. Um, and I think maybe again, this is the classic thing, Peter dying helped the process, meaning I don't think the film would have debuted now if Peter was still alive. I think they were moving it a more, but once he passed, I think people made the usual extra effort, you know, oh, okay, yes. let's, let's, let's get this ready. Um, the Museum of Modern Art, which is, you know, obviously a very reputable high class place yes. to, to show the film was, was what wanted to show it. And so they, they made the effort and it got out there. Um, so I know I'm rambling a little bit, but hopefully it's interesting information. No, do you know what? It's, it's all interesting because this is just like, this is the stuff you never hear about, you know, this is usually forgotten. Well, that's, what's that's what's scary, because what the film really showed me, and this is what I mentioned in the article, New Hollywood versus Now Hollywood, where, where, where there was even a shot in the film with Jennifer Aniston in her office where they apparently digitally manipulated it to make it a close-up. You know, that like, yes. I had mentioned to Peter, oh, they used a close-up. He's like, I never shot a close-up. You know, they, they must have used a computer to make it a close-up, um, where they don't seem to have respect you know, like for these you know it's like so everybody thinks they know everything but they don't listen to the guy they hired who had the academy award nominations and, and yes. the success um and it makes you think because if i had never found this tape um oh and that's yeah that's the digression i forgot uh i always assumed they might go back and call the production company and then it would turn out it was on some hard drive somewhere just nobody really had cared about it for all these years yeah but apparently nope i mean as far as i know this 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 is it for whatever reason um that basically you wonder, it just reminds you how many films have you watched that were completely obliterated before they ever came out and you don't know anything about it. Yeah. You know? it's just, well, it's that's just... it, you know, uh, un unless you you had sort of thought I'm looking for a different version. Yeah. No, no one would know, you know, but that would have died possibly with Peter Bogdanovich. It would have, I mean, I mean, the only thing that again was when you watch She's Funny that way, um, you do see like, again, quick glimpses of scenes with like Owen Wilson and Jennifer Aniston and a bunch of people where I'm like, well, there must be a scene they shot, even though we're just seeing two seconds of it. But I mean, especially with a director who shoots more coverage, because that's why all that, that interview footage is there is because Peter cuts in the camera. And what that basically means for people who may not know the term, um, most directors, including some very good ones, you know, um, but but they, they just shoot a scene from a lot of different angles to protect themselves, you know, so that way they can edit it. Whereas a lot of the classic directors, such as Hitchcock and John Ford and Hawks and, and Peter Bogdanovich, and there are others now too, although it's increasingly hard where the producer is king and Marvel is king and things like that, where he says, oh no, this scene, I got to figure out the best way to shoot it. So I'm going to shoot a close up on her when she talks. I'm going to need to two shot for his reaction. And that's all he shoots, you know, yeah. and then he'll stage. And so there's nothing they can really edit. So what they did is they added, because we keep saying she's funny that weighs 89 minutes, but it also contains 15 minutes of this interview footage, you know, that of, of Imogen Poots being interviewed by Leanna Douglas. So it's really missing 40 minutes of the original film. Um, but they use that footage because that way, whenever they want to cut, they just go back to the scene of Imogen Poots talking to Ileana yeah. Douglas. Well, there's, a, there's um, like that opening sequence where Owen Wilson's at the airport. I mean, they, yes. they cut the shit out of that, you know. It was and, not in the movie at all. The airport's yeah. not in the movie. The, the, the bagpipe scene's not in the movie. The um, Most of the party's not in the movie at the end. I mean, there's a couple brief glimpses of it. Um, 
But it's like, as you see, it's a classic Bogdanovich uh, beginning, like movies, what many of his films, you, you know, you don't start with dialogue. You sort of start almost voyeuristically. Who is yeah. this person? Why is this person here? They all have does the same thing. Uh, um, the last picture show starts slowly with Jeff Bridges and Timothy Bottoms kind of walking around the town. And so you just see, it's like, he's really setting up this rondelay. Austin Pendleton passes Owen Wilson in the airport and they don't know each other, you know, but it's setting up, they're both going to be in the film and this, um, it doesn't spell out the conflict. And, and, and then, you know, it just reveals itself eventually. I mean, Catherine Hahn doesn't show up till about a half an hour in. Jennifer Aniston doesn't show up till half an hour in. Um, and one key thing, which you may or may not have noticed, even when the scenes were kept in She's Funny that way, they often cut off the head or the tail of the scene. So one scene that I always liked in She's Funny that way, because it felt like a Bogdanovich scene, is when Owen Wilson's on the bed calling the escorts, but also talking to his wife on the on the other phone. Hiding it under the phone, yeah. yeah. And it's a long take kind of pulling in slowly and he's getting to act, you know, without cuts doing the whole scene. And the, the gag is, you know, who am I talking to? Or the escort service? Or am I talking to my kid? Um, and it ends with him um, hanging up and saying, I love you to his wife. And, and then you see on his face, this look of like exasperation and guilt and frustration. Like, you know, you, it's sort of like, so I, I know I'm doing a horrible thing, but I almost can't help myself, you know? Yep. Um, and when they, sh when they put the scene in the other film, they cut off that shot. I mean, they cut off the end of the shot where he has that look on his face. And I just felt like there was, there was nothing they wanted to leave for the audience to figure out. Owen Wilson doesn't look at the camera and say, I am conflicted. You know, <laughs> this is disturbing yeah. me. I know. Um, what they do is they have Imogen Poots say it. She goes, I know what he did was wrong, but you know, it's like, we, didn't, we don't need her. That's it, because you, you know? until uh, quite a bit into the movie, you don't really know what he's doing. You know, you don't know mm. that this is something he perpetually does. It just unfolds that way. Well, that's where he, he respects your intelligence. And I feel, um, in other words, it's, it's, not, it's not an art film. It's a comedy. It's, just, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's sort of a cross of, they all laugh with some of its emotional components, but a lot of the silliness of what's up doc, slamming doors and people hiding in showers and you know things like that. Um, but yes, in other words, he, he does his little spiel where he basically tells a little anecdote that involves squirrels to the nuts to Imogen Poots as he offers her $30,000. And only a half an hour later, do you suddenly have another call girl show up and say, yes. oh my gosh, it's you, you gave me... Um, and so the idea is that like, he's patient. He's like, I can wait. You know, they, they don't yeah. have to know this <laughs> until later. And, um, uh, you know, I just feel that unfortunately the film is sort of a, a sign of how often I think modern directors who don't even have the reputation of Peter Bogdanovich can't, you know, they bring in a cut and the producers go, yeah, yeah, that's great. Now let's recut it. Let's do this. Let's yeah. do that. Um, and, and how a great movie can actually just be destroyed in the edit. Yeah, I mean, She's Funny That Way is sort of an adequate film in a way. It was watchable. You know, I was able to sit through it and it has some funny bits. But once you've seen Squirrels to the Nuts, yeah. I think you're almost offended watching She's Funny That Way. Yeah. <laughs> like, what's going on here? And he shot it all. Just to be clear, he did. He stuck with it. Um, and and But I mean, I think the, the final footage just kind of reeks of a little bit of desperation. Like, the, um, you know, Imogen Poots is talking about how she watched old Fred Astaire movies on PBS. I mean, that sounds like Peter, you know, trying to create, yeah. keep some of the old Hollywood in it. Um but I don't think, you know, it just doesn't feel like Peter, you know, it, it's, it was clearly shot quickly. It's, it's a basically a bunch of close-ups, close-up of Poots, close-up of Douglas. You know, there's no, there's no interaction between them. It feels like he had three hours to shoot it, you know? Yeah, <laughs> and, kinda, and it's all very and, dark background as well. There's no real cinematography to it. Yeah, no, no. And it, it's so utterly non Bogdanovichian, I guess, in a sense, you know, that, uh, um, you know, because he loves... Uh, what what I call, it's a term David Mamet used, um, gang comedies, where it's sort of like, and it's not the same as an ensemble, because an ensemble can have different people who never meet, you know, but it's just a large cast. Yeah. A gang comedy is like Howard Hawks's Only Angels Have Wings, or or even Mamet used it to describe his own Glen Gary, Glen Ross, where you have characters in an environment who work together or live together, you know, like DC Cab would be a, a gang comedy, you know, and, it's, and, and Squirrels to the Nuts is a movie about a bunch of people who interact and fall in and out of love. And, you know, and, and, and she's funny that way is not that it's utterly, you know, well, that's, um, and I mean, again, you, you look at squirrels to the nuts and it's a complete film. You do look at, she's funny that way and think, who did they think was going to watch this? You know, who is the target audience of that film? Yeah, no, I mean, the good news too, is I, in a sense, what's funny is for once, um, you know, it's getting reissued and the actors in it are still relatively hot, meaning, you know, Owen Wilson and Jennifer yeah. Aniston are still leads. Catherine Hahn is an even bigger actress now. She's she's built her reputation, Will Forte. Uh, all I meant was I think actually people, 
you know, oh, there's a new film or a recut film or whatever you want to call it. I think it has a chance to get, you know, to get some attention because I think there are a fair number of people who like all these actors, you know, who uh, yeah. might, you know, give it a fair chance. So, so hopefully, I mean, my understanding is, yes, it isn't one and done. I mean, they're, they're hoping to, excuse me, you know, whether it's going to go to festivals or just go straight to streaming. Uh, again, that's not my, right. my job. Um, what, what, what's with your journey now on the film? What, what can take, what, continuation do you have with it or are you kind of going well it's out there now well uh, i mean humorously at this moment i thought at some level because you know with peter passing some of the things we were going to do together we're obviously not going to do together you know um but you know i i i am in touch with louise and you know so there's various things not so much about this film just regarding peter projects you know things they wanted sure. to finish you know that i'm going to help with uh in whatever way whatever way i can but um I, you know as i said i assumed once i gave it to peter you know, they would have they would have been making DCPs, digital copies. He told me they were going to make prints of the film, but then the museum did email me a couple of weeks ago, and they said you still have that tape, right? <laughs> I said yes. And, um, they go, yeah, because um, we don't the, the, the DCP or the MP4 that was shared with us from the Bogdanovich camp, um, it's not really of a quality to project in our big serious movie theater. What? Uh, and so they're like, can we borrow your tape? And I said, well, sure. Um, you know, I, I hope I don't get hit by a bus walking over because that cancels your whole <laughs> screening, apparently. Um, so I'm, I'm involved in the sense they're showing my, my the, the legendary tape that, that, that is featured in that article. It's the one playing at the museum right now. I, I, I presume with the music rights sewn up, now perhaps they'll start spending money on, you know, right. now that they know the songs can remain. Um, but no, no, again, it was sort of that, that odd thing where it was just really, it's like, I, I, it's like you found a wallet with Peter Budanovich's, you know, I would return it to him. Right. So I found yeah. this movie <laughs> and I gave it back to him just to do what he would, because obviously it was worth it. I mean, even just looking back, you know, becoming a good friend of my favorite director for, for the last, uh, I mean, yes. you know, I wasn't his best personal friend, but you know, we, we spoke, you know, eight or nine times, seven or eight times on the phone and emailed 60 times or whatever like that, you know, that kind of thing where it was, it was perfectly, um, and yeah, he didn't disappoint, meaning he was the guy, you know, he, he was talkative, he loved to talk about movies, if he yeah. did, but he would talk, he did talk to me about El Elton Musk or whatever his name is, Elon Musk going into space and how idiotic it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also just ultimately that, uh, I th that, that his, his movie was returned and I think, yeah. you know, he, he felt vindicated like, yeah, no, I'm not, I am as, uh, yeah, I don't, it's, I don't think it's ego, it's just like, I'm sure part of him was like, without having access to his cut, you know, were they right? Did I really screw it up that badly? <laughs> you know? well, that's it. And the, the days of having negatives and those sorts of things, they're long gone. So all you have to do is erase a hard drive and the stuff's gone for good. That's true. But we also got lucky because in the 1970s, you would never have a pristine HD copy available on a thing <laughs> so, like eBay. Yeah. You know, they would have, they, have, they might have all various, uh, un, you know, uh, negatives and, and things but the fact that I was able to get my hands on basically an HD copy of an end cut is a very 21st century <laughs> it is and a miracle I, I mean a true miracle that it exists with, with as it was the only, the yeah. only I mean again at some point maybe somebody will open a drawer and find three more copies I mean, I've never argued that that would happen I, I always assumed that you know um, the production house would be like oh yeah we still got it on a computer somewhere you know but yeah what, if they do they haven't found it you know I, I mean no and knowing how technology progresses it might be on some hard drive that is an outmoded hard drive that's just stuck yeah. in some you know, closet nobody even knows but, but they, um, they would they possibly wouldn't have the passion that you have or you know and, and peter's not a lot run to to sort of it to be given to him in order for it to come back well, that's 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 it. I, I was more just thinking that, you know, um, once he had a copy and he went to people, they might say, OK, now that you're coming to us, yes, we do have another copy. But as far as I know, that didn't happen. Um, luckily, again, I don't want to say luckily, I don't know the details, but with Peter passing, you know, I, I just think maybe some of his friends, I mean, Frank Moore, you know, those people, they might have stepped up and, yeah. and, and helped because um, unfortunately, there's there's always more interest in a dead legend than a struggling artist who's alive <laughs> yes so, unfortunately yeah you know, but um but peter was i mean peter was still very active he, he was working on a script about the gershwin brothers uh when he passed he, he co-wrote it with somebody uh, um somebody of relative note i don't remember his name so i apologize if he ever sees this but uh, <laughs> but he was working on a script and again the, the idea is obviously he's not going to direct it now but apparently there are directors looking at the script and they might they might film it um uh, and he, and he, I know he has books coming out. He, he had a book of interviews that was is, is coming with Clint Eastwood, among other people. What? Clint Eastwood and and um, I think it was, you know, I forget, you know, the five or six people were named, you know, he told me. And then there is a book of his his original uh, 
uh, he was famous for taking notes on the films he saw as a young film enthusiast, you know, through the 50s and the 60s. Yeah. Um, and so Knopf, which is a very reputable, serious publisher, is going to put out a book of those, uh, his his film notes from the 60s. Really? And 50s. Yeah. And, uh, so, so I'm thinking that, you know, in a sense, he was a guy whose reputation was harmed a bit because society does love winners in a sense, you know, yeah. and, and he had started out strong commercially, which is still, you know, capitalist society. That's what we kind of focus on. Right. You know, yeah. uh, and, and, and while I think a lot of people love almost, you know, all his movies, you know, noises off or mask or, you know, thing called love, um, you know, have their following. He still thought of kind of as a guy, yeah, he had a really hot start, you know, and if you're not a fan, Oh yeah, that's the guy who faded, you know, yeah. um, and you know he's a good actor. He was good on The Sopranos. You know, but 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 Squirrels to the Nuts, I, I think it really shows because again, people don't talk about this enough, or just who who's really talked about it at all. It is. It was his first auteurist project since uh, they all laughed in 1980, 1981. This is my script. This is the movie I want to make. Um, and I just think it's a spot on Peter Bogdanovich film. Yeah. You know, and, and and so part of me goes man what about the other 10 things he should have made in the last 30 years you know, well that were, that's the um, thing i mean even if that had have been released in its original version it might have led to something else that you know because it would have been received you know better when it came out oh no well that i i feel if it came out in its original version now you know we'll we'll see when some of the reviews come in now but I mean, plenty of people know and understand Peter Bradovich, so whether it's Richard Brody in The New Yorker or whoever, you know, that, that like they would have given it positive reviews, whether it made any money or not. And that, that would have been, yeah. you know, like Martin Scorsese makes silence. It didn't really make any money at all, but people recognize it's, it's, it's a, a great good film. Movie, yeah. <laughs> you know, so so it's just I think it would have helped um, him continue to try to get, you know, grab, uh, you know, uh, f uh, film gigs, you know, directing gigs. Yeah. Um, uh, cuz he only made the great buster by uh, the documentary about buster keaton he did make one more documentary after uh squirrels to the nuts but i mean and, and obviously i'd be happy to make a documentary but it was still a relatively minor assignment in peter's overall yes yeah, so um, it's not yeah. narrative you know and that that's the thing as good as it was which is a brilliant documentary yeah. just to see another film from him that told one of his stories would have been brilliant yeah no no and so, and so luckily in its own way it, it is kind of interesting that peter has passed and yet He's he's delivering one more gift to the film world, you know. Yes. In a sense, now like squirrel. I mean, just saying. Uh, again, somebody might see it, and you know, I, I don't. know, They might not love it. I mean, What's Up Doc didn't get universal rave reviews when it came out, but but it is. If if you like any of that stuff, Paper Moon, they all. It's a Peter Bogdanovich film at a hundred percent. Um, and and I think I think at this point we're kind of starved for real movies made by adults. You know? Yes, definitely. <laughs> with, with real actors who I mean I don't hate action films, but I mean certainly action fans have get are getting their fill these days. <laughs> it's, That's it, and it must be great for for you to know that you're responsible for that being on a big screen and not just to a streamer. Well, no, well that well that is exciting. I mean, yeah, I'm going to go see it. I'm I'm introducing the film. It is running March 28th through April 5th at the Museum of Modern Art. Which doesn't help people in Europe, but somebody might watch this. Who, you know, who's in New York? Um, I'll be introducing it the first night, um, but I'm, I'm going to go a couple of nights because I just want to see it on the big screen. Yeah. <laughs> it's sort of like a, uh, and as as I think I don't know if I actually wrote this anywhere. I mean, I'm cer it's certainly not my baby, but it is kind of my adopted child. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I, I found floating down the river and I picked it up and uh, and now it's out in the world. It's graduated, you know, in a sense. Um, no, that that's brilliant. I mean. It it's no small thing to say. It really is almost a miracle. You know, it's like a cinematic miracle that it is out there and that you stumbled across it on eBay, no less. Well, and it, I mean, P Peter was a guy who believed in signs. And, and again, after Dorothy Stratton passed, the woman he loved yeah. who was murdered, um, I, he got he was very interested in numerology and signs. And he believed, you know, that there are, you know, um, and, and so like one of the unproduced scripts um, he sent me was a movie called Wait For Me, which he, he that was one he's been trying to produce for about 25 years or 30 years. It was originally announced with John Ritter and Sybil Shepard. Um, uh, but you know, it, it, it's a script that is not dated, though, because it involves it's a director who has like six ex-wives, but he also has uh, um, his best friend and his, his the woman of that he loved. They died in a plane wreck together. And um and these ghosts all start showing up and harassing him in the movie. And it would have worked now because of the CGI. It's actually yeah. a film that he could have probably done even easier now. Um, but so, so it's just this, this kind of eccentric thing where, where like, um, you know, I looked at eBay, eBay at the right moment, spotted this thing, you know, the, the guy who saw they all laughed when he was 11 years old and became a huge fan of McDonovich. And then just, just one minor humorous um, thing. 
you know, maybe Peter's up there pushing some, you know, <laughs> pushing some buttons right now, is there was one project by Peter that still nobody's ever seen. It, it, it's a television pilot he made in the 1990s called Prowler with Scott Bakula, the actor from Quantum, Quantum Leap and things like that. And so he shot this pilot, which was not picked up, so it was never aired. So, of course, as a Bogdanovich completist, I'm like, I have to see this. It's the only thing. Yeah. Um, and, and it turns out I was able to get my hands on it. That's and it's just funny because it's not quite proof, but the weekend that I got my hands on it, about two weeks ago, for some reason, somebody put up on eBay the script for that pilot. Like, you know, this unaired, unproduced, unseen pilot nobody knows of. I go on eBay, Prowler, pilot episode. You know, it was 25 bucks and I, I had to buy it. It wasn't able to drop <laughs> it in my lap. But I'm just like, what, you know, I'm, I'm trying to write about this unseen Bedanovich television pilot. And then that weekend, the script shows up. So right. I have a, you know, a very interesting thing to look at alongside the actual show itself. I'm is like, it, did somebody? Is it anything to do with the 1950s film, The Prowler, or is it? Just no, no, it was it's just a television pilot about, you know, Scott Bakula is a uh, cop with some guilt, which, you know, I'm going to write about it. But basically, I think it was just yeah, Prowler. It's just the, the name yeah. of the show. Um, and again, and, and, and it's interesting because some of his TV work was definitely, you felt like he was just trying to hit a schedule. Like he did some stuff like uh, The Naked City, Killer Christmas, which was like a, you know, Scott Glenn and Courtney Vance. And it was kind of a cop film shot in Canada, mostly. You know, it wasn't really his wheelhouse, if you know what yeah. I mean. But um but there were certain things he directed because he, he did want to put, we were going to talk for an article because he was hoping to put out a box set of some of his television work. He's not ashamed of it. He, he says, um, he said, you know, oh yeah, nobody saw it, but millions of people. <laughs> and what he means by that is, you know, a lot of this stuff like, yeah, LA, Hollywood, New York, Intelligentsia wasn't reviewing it or spending a lot of attention looking at it. But especially back in the 90s, if a movie played on network television, you know, 25 million people <laughs> watched it, you yeah. know, and then, um, so, so there were certain works he did. There was a show called Fallen Angels. I don't know if you're aware of it. It was sort of no. a film noir TV show. Sidney Pollock and Tom Cruise are actually some of the producers on it. But he made an episode called Dime a Dance with Eric Stoltz and Jennifer Grey. Eric Stoltz had been in Mask. Um, and there was another show called Picture Windows where he does kind of a romantic drama with George Siegel, famous 1970s actor. And he got to direct um, some of the great black actors, Sidney Poitier and Sir With Love Too and Cicely Tyson in a thing called The Price of Heaven. And I said this to him in conversation. He didn't say it to me, but he kind of chuckled. It's like, not, not that that was your favored, you know, he would have rather been a, a hot Hollywood director, I'm sure. Yeah. But it's almost like that was your period working for a studio, like the old directors, you know, yeah. where we're like, you're working for Warner Brothers and they just give you assignments. Okay, here's, and, and you would have never made a film noir, you know, as, as a feature sure, yeah. Hollywood film at that point. And C Cicely Tyson and Sidney Poitier are legends, but they, they, they're not movie stars currently. It wouldn't have gotten funding to make yeah. movies with them theatrically, but you got to direct them. And, and, and he, you know, he kind of liked that framing of it, you know, you're talking about <laughs> it, um, because he felt like some, like there's a movie called The Price of Heaven. It was recalled Blessed Assurance. I'll just give you that title because it's out there. There's, there's a DVD out there of it. Um, to me, that's really a, 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 ma a minor masterpiece, meaning that feels like it's a television movie. Um, I think uh, Cicely Tyson's in it. Lori, Lori Laughlin from Full House is in it. And, and a, a Grant Show from Melrose Place, you know. But it takes place in the 1950s and it deals with racism in America. And um, it feels like one of those things like, like Sling Blade or something. If Miramax had released it, I think it would have got nominations and everything. I mean, since yeah. it's a TV movie, nobody paid much attention. But if you're really like Bogdanovich, it's shot in the Bogdanovich style. Long takes, you know, actors moving around the frame. Um, and, and and so some of these things I think are are, are masterpieces or close to it, you know, you know, yeah. maybe not a masterpiece, but a close enough approximation by a great director is still interesting, you know. Um, and so so uh, Prowler, I was going to say Prowler is sort of on that side of it. It's still a television pilot, so he's basically just setting up a show. But um, the movie begins or the show begins again with a Bruce Springsteen song. And later on, there's a John Lennon song. And he had recently shot a video for Yoko Ono just before doing this. So, 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 so I just get the feeling that, you know, he was putting some care into this. You know, he was he was asking his friends for songs. And, and uh, so, again, and maybe maybe it'll become available because um, as far as I know, his camp is is well aware he wanted to make a TV movie box set. And that's something that hasn't been done yet. So. So I could just say, looking forward, let's hope that that does get made because there's a lot of good stuff there. You know? Well, that's, I mean, it sounds like there's a, there's a great amount of Bogdanovich stuff coming down, you know, now that he's unfortunate that he's gone, but that his legacy will continue, which. Yeah, I, I think, I, I don't know if you felt this too, but I felt the day he died, the next day, a lot of people remembered how great he was, you know, yes. like, which is good in a way. You know? Yeah, you, you like, saw on Twitter, it's as if he was the biggest director, you know, that, that, that was still at the top of his game and people had forgotten about him and suddenly it was like, 
you know, all the all the people who hadn't appreciated him over the years finally sort of came out of the woodwork? Yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty much it. I don't even think it's that's hard. I think certain people knew him because he'd spent so much time in the recent past still being a voice of Hollywood. He would do interviews and he would do screenings and he would, t- he would talk about other stars. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think people really felt the loss of, you know, because the incredible knowledge he had of, of, of Hollywood. Yeah. Um, and, and the fact is, even as a struggling director, he's still alive. And as we see, I mean, Scorsese's his age, Coppola's his age. It's kind of hard to, fa- you know, it's, it, a lot of people are starting to pass that, you know, we're taken personally because we knew them so well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, and I, and I think more so than the older generations because of DVD and video and stuff. No, they don't leave us the way, the way by 1980, Jimmy Cagney would have been a star 40 years earlier, but like, you know, us kids didn't know him that well. Yeah. You know, I think younger people though, you know, we're watching all those eighties and seventies movies and on DVD and they're out there. And, and so I think Peter's a reminder. I mean, now I'm being a little grim, you know, they're all going to go at some point. We're all going to go at some point. Well, yeah. <laughs> But it's just like it's like it's like you never thought though his career was done. You know he was still an active person. So in the sense, I don't think anybody really said, "Oh wait, now he now he's passed. There, there is no more." It's a brilliant way to compare what can be done with a movie once it's been taken away and changed yeah. and reshaped. You know, and then you you rarely get to see such good examples of that. You know, and this is a, a prime one. No, no, no. It's it's really it's it's the modern technology plus. It, it, it allowed them to abuse the film fairly easily, but luckily it allowed the original, you know, one tape had the film in yeah. its basically finished uh, form. So, yeah, so let's just hope, yeah, let's just, because again, life is filled with all the little potholes, though. I'm just, I'm just, yeah. um, you never you know, know what's going to happen next. So, uh. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if next week it turns out the film is pulled and nobody ever sees it again, then we're really lucky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where can we find you, James, online? Yeah, I mean, basically, I, I, I no, it's, it's treblesiwonder.com is my website where I write um, about various films. And then, the you know, at J.F. Kenny, K-E-N-N-E-Y is my Twitter handle, which you already know. Otherwise, I'm a teacher. I'm a working man. <laughs> it's, not like I, it's, it's not like I'm running around. But it's, it's like I write for my site. Well, the yeah. Things I want to write, as, you, as you've seen, about very, you know, sometimes new movies, sometimes old movies. But off my, my sort of bread and butter are those longer pieces that do go into the background of the makings of some of them yeah. as well. I talk about them. And, and I generally focus on, you know, Films like whether it's Down Twisted or, or or Looker or Eleven Harrow House, you know, films that were not necessarily considered classics but have a lot of interesting elements yeah. um, is what I often like to focus on. Yeah. No, well, great. Do you know what? Lovely meeting you. Um, yeah, again, nice you. thank you for your time. And uh, yeah, hopefully at some point in the future, we'll, we'll do this again and talk Absolutely. about something else. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Movies and Focus podcast. You can download it wherever you get your podcasts. And I hope that you tell your friends about it. That's it for this time, and I'll see you at the movies.